the crypt. What is up, freaks? Welcome back to Tales from the Crypt. Very excited for this week's episode. We have the brothers O'Byrne in the studio. Unfortunately, uh, the first five minutes of our conversation got cut off, so you're going to miss the intro. So I'm going to do that now. Uh, we have Will O'Byrne and James O'Byrne. Will is uh, is working on MyCrypto.com, uh, working on apps and sort of the tangential apps of Ethereum. So we're going to get an Ethereum perspective on this episode. And then James, his older brother, is working at Chain Code Labs, contributing to Bitcoin Core full time. So we have a, a pretty pretty polarizing uh, pair of brothers here. We get into a very interesting conversation. We talked for about three hours. So I had to cut it up into two episodes. So here is the first hour and a half. Hope you guys enjoy. We've moved on from, maybe not entirely from that conversation, but mm-hmm. it certainly carries less weight now compared to all the good. And I think prediction markets are going to go the same way where, you know, assassination markets is the first thing that we talk about now. But later we're going to see all sorts of you know, interesting byproducts of it. Yeah, I mean, so I come from a background with futures markets, and like that's just, that's how you set prices for goods and sort of predict how much coin there's going to be in the going. You use price price pointers, and if you could if you could make this more equitable and more more distributed, that's fucking incredible. I mean, yeah, because markets aren't always efficient. For what it's worth, I just want to put a footnote in there that that um, we should stick up for drugs. You know, um, <laughs> I, I think facilitating a, a, a nonviolent crime is is great. So yeah, I'm all I, I'm all for drugs. Sorry, whenever I think <laughs> drug money, <laughs> I I immediately jump to cartels, which is not. Oh well, the, these markets actively help to. Um, probably remove some power from cartels right oh you're preaching to the choir i just mean when when people you know state like oh drugs are bad for this or that i feel like more often than not what they're communicating i mean obviously there are some people who think for whatever reason drugs are morally reprehensible but um sort of empowering uh like shady figures to further remain under detection right yeah, the drug war is fucking stupid. I can't believe it's still going on. Like, how long has it been now? Like, oh, geez. Uh, Nixon or not Nixon? Reagan started the drug that, war. That sounds right. I'm not uh, not versed in uh, the history of that. And it's, I mean, let's be frank. We're fucking living in a time where like legal drugs are killing more people than illegal <laughs> drugs. I would, I would argue. Like, we have an opioid crisis epidemic. Some would argue in this country. Uh, people get on the heroin. Uh, the gateway drug to heroin is like Oxycontin, opiate painkillers like that, and it's gotten fucking out of hand. And if we were to hold bar like full, just fucking legalize drugs, I, I'm not I'm not even talking decriminalization. I'm just saying make them legal. One, most people won't want to do them. Like th- it'll be that that like oh they're they're legal now. Like oh they're not cool. Mm-hmm. That social aspect, and then. For the people that do do them, you set up safe environments for them. Like in Philadelphia, I'm actually proud to be from Philly. They set up like a safe, uh, uh, a safe opiate clinic for where people can inject heroin, like in a safe environment with clean needles, and that goes a long way to sort of making sure people don't die. Like people are going to do drugs no matter what. Mm-hmm. Humans have done drugs forever. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. Not like Ronald Reagan's not going to stop human nature. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want someone to feel afraid to like reach out for help because i mean that's another thing is like if you check into a clinic you might be worried about losing your job or something like that you know i I think that having it be legal has all these positive side effects again you know so similar to what we were just talking about the first thing you jump to is oh but then everybody's going to be doing drugs but i think once that happens that conversation will also kind of die down as we see all the positive benefits yeah something like that I heard this this quote that's uh, simultaneously funny and sad the other day, um, and it's something like, um, Aldous Huxley thought that television would be the opiate of the masses, um, but it turns out that opiates are the opiate of the masses. <laughs> uh, too soon. Who'd have thought? Too soon. It's, um, yeah. Uh, but one note on the auger end um, of the discussion, I guess, um, uh, a lot of people, I think, don't realize that Bitcoin as a system is capable of facilitating the same kind of you know prediction market pattern that something like Augur is doing. Um, 
maybe Augur is much farther along than, than anything on the Bitcoin side. But um, one really interesting piece of work to check out is um, uh, a paper called uh, Discrete Log Contracts, which basically outlines uh, a means for, for doing this kind of thing um, uh, using Bitcoin primitives. Um, and that's by uh, Taj Dreya, who mm. I think is one of the, the co-inventors of the Lightning uh, Network concept. Yeah, that, that's one of the prediction markets. And then we have Paul Paul uh, Stork Sports, whatever, how you, however you pronounce his last name, is Hivebind, um, that he wants to do in a drive chain. But uh, the the security of drive chains have not been proven yet. You're basically trusting miners not to steal your money. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, so let's dive into this. So this is the big driver of tribalism in crypto is, again, going back to the move fast and break things versus the slow and steady. Uh, what I, why I hate on Ethereum so much, I try not to. I, I'm, I'm weak. I'm a weak bitch. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> oh, don't say that, Marty. You, you got some biceps on you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I don't know if it's ever been called out, but um, Marty's a beefcake. Oh. Just <laughs> to the listeners at home, <laughs> it's official. Certified Bitcoin beefcake. Yeah, I've got, I've got a, a beefcake. I come from a beefcake lineage. Broad <laughs> shoulders. Never really get fat. Just get bulky. Um, but going back to cryptocurrency, you know. Um, so the debate I fall back on, like the heuristic. So I am dumb. All you freaks out there know that I'm fucking dumb. He's and, not. And I fall back on heuristics like what you should build the foundation of. Like we're gonna, we're we're envisioning a world of new money and a decentralized world built on these blockchains. And my heuristic is that at the protocol level, like people focus on the protocol too much and want to do everything on the protocol level. But I think it should be slow, dumb and very good at what it purports it will do, and then you just anchor trust into it on other layers. So that's why I have qualms with Ethereum, where they sort of hastily threw together their protocol level, I would argue, and it is is led to a huge attack surface at the protocol level. And, I mean, they're trying to do everything at the protocol level, from what I understand. Um, And, James, like you were saying, like, you can do these prediction markets on Bitcoin, it's just going to take time, like, to build out. Like, what... What are the trade-offs of, of moving fast like Ethereum like and moving slow like Bitcoin? So there is a chance that Bitcoin moves too slow that Ethereum figures it out and and beats Bitcoin to market to an extent. Um, so will what like what draws you towards that sort of at the protocol level with Ethereum? Because look, one thing, the uh, Clemendia, was that the uh, the eclipse attacks on Ethereum? Uh, did you read that white paper? No, I haven't. But the potential eclipse, of, like this is one like one example of where like when Vitalik and crew were building out the protocol level, is it Clemendia? Is that what it was? I'm not sure. I don't Chlamydia? Know it no, it sounds like Chlamydia. We were, we were joking about this last night, but they used basically um, sort of a, a well-known service to help nodes connect with each other quickly, and it, it the service made it so that like eclipse attacks uh, were very like highly probable on ethereum's network and that's just like one thing they did that from like the get-go and that wasn't something that was taken into consideration and i think that like hastily thrown together at the protocol level just like doesn't sit well with me now can you clarify on that is that is that the the bootstrap node basically the first thing you connect to yes and is is that something that is um kind of software independent like you have many different um you know, node clients like Geth and uh, Parity are, are kind of the two big ones. Because, you know, I often hear things about, oh, Solidity is garbage or, you know, something something about, um, something else about the Ethereum ecosystem is tough to work with. And I don't hear a lot of complaints about, um, or, I, you know, I don't hear a lot of criticisms of actually the, the, the core stuff. Those those are layers on top of Ethereum. I mean, you have the EVM, uh, which many languages could be built against. You have things like Viper and, and other uh, languages that are trying to be a little bit more, like, error, less error-prone. Um, and you have, you know, different node clients. Like, th- those, to me, those kinds of problems aren't, like, multi-year problems. That's some of the software that was written today that could be changed tomorrow. Mm-hmm. 
you know, has this one potential issue. Uh, yeah, and to be to be clear with everybody, like this attack's been patched. Like it's, I'm pretty sure it's not it's not possible anymore. But again, this is going. So here's from Bitcoin Magazine article titled "Researchers Explore Eclipse Attacks on the Ethereum Blockchain." If you guys want to look it up. Uh, here's just a snippet, but as it turns out, Ethereum was actually easier to attack mainly because while Bitcoin relies on an unstructured network where nodes form random connections with each other, Ethereum relies on a structured network based on the protocol called Kademlia. Kademlia, that's what it's called, uh, which is designed to allow nodes to connect to other nodes more efficiently. Um, so nodes in Ethereum's peer-to-peer network are identified by their public key. Remarkably, Ethereum versions prior to Geth v 1.81 allowed a user to run an unlimited number of nodes each with a different public key from the same machine within the same ip address yeah so um break that down for us dumb people please (laughs) um let's see i can't comment too much on the way that ethereum uh, does things but what what i can tell you is that um this stuff is really unintuitive so actually bootstrapping the nodes that you have an outbound connection to, which is um, basically the nodes that you you trust more than an inbound connection, right? Because if someone's trying to attack you, it's really easy to open a connection to your node. But if you actually have a choice of who you initially connect to, then you can do a good job of choosing peers. Um, so Ethan Heilman, who did a lot of early work on um, the Eclipse stuff, he may have even coined that, that name, I'm not sure. but um, Yeah, it's he, who wrote this paper. Yeah, yeah. He came and, and gave a really great, uh, he spent some time with the residency and gave a few really great talks on the thinking that went into countermeasures within Bitcoin to avoid um, these kind of, you know, eclipse attacks, or I guess more generally civil attacks. Um, and so one naive way to do it, which which may or may not be, may or may not kind of resemble how, for example, Geth was doing it, is that you could select peers that you know, you could prefer to peers with that ha- that have a low latency relative to you are, and that you know that might be efficient. Or you can you could you could peer with somebody who's you know um, delivering blocks very quickly. Um, but uh, obviously, that's kind of gameable because if you know someone's in a certain data center, you, know, you can spin up a node in that data center too, um, connect to them um, in overwhelming number. I guess that's disproportionate to to your hardware. Um, and and then you know feed them bad information. Um, so so Ethan actually implemented or suggested a number of cri- really interesting criteria um, to help deal with this situation. Like for example, um, he he buckets peers based on their subnet. So um, he he ensures a distribution across the IP address space to some extent. Um, the thinking being that it's pretty hard to obtain um, a diverse set of IP addresses beyond uh, beyond a certain point, and so that's that's just one way of, of mitigating that. But there are all kinds of heuristics um, that go into the selection of, of which peers that you want to pair up with. Yeah, I mean, it's cra- like it's crazy how granular you have to get, and like and think about these attack vectors, like an eclipse attack, like the thought of somebody intentionally buying a uh, space at a data center that you are using just to eclipse attack you just like that's deep down the rabbit hole thinking there yeah and I, I think that's why I'm I'm personally so conservative and, and slow moving with all this stuff is because um, you don't it, it, it's sometimes a priori hard to tell which details are going to become relevant um, which which details of design are going to you know uh, pose a risk to the system um, and so I think you know, it behooves us for for this technology that we know almost nothing about to be extremely risk averse. Um, and I, I think sometimes um, people in the Bitcoin community beef a little bit on on um, some of the popular choices in the Ethereum community because there's there's sort of a cavalier attitude about um, oh you know we'll we'll just kind of seek social consensus for this or you know um, we'll trust some number of our peers or you know whatever it is and. Um, I, I think any any degree of hand waving can can get kind of risky, and I mean, not every you know nobody can avoid um, uh, like there's no there's no silver bullet. Nobody can avoid some amount of hand waving because we don't know how this stuff is going to play out over decades. But um, I think you need to be as um, 
as careful as you can be. I agree, but I can also see the Ethereum side where it's like, hey, we don't fucking know. Let's try as much as we can. I mean, I, I think that might that might be a little uh, more off the cuff than they are to say just fucking try it. No, but, you know, I think yeah. I think there, you know, there is a lot of consideration. Um, I mean, going and reading any any of their like they write very nice FAQs on. Uh, I can't remember which GitHub repository it is, but there's one one uh, directory called FAQs, and I really like that. Is that the one from Carl? Not sure. I don't think so. Yeah, it might be. Um, but anyway, you know, explaining things like, um, obviously before I came on the show, I had to buff up. I knew I was going to get slaughtered by some beefy Bitcoin boys. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> So you know the resources are out there, and and and, and I, I was reading up, and and I mean there there is a lot of consideration for these mm-hmm. kinds of, um, you know, game theory esque issues. Um, and, and another thing, you know, just to, to to not that Eclipse is the only ever vulnerability that um, has ever come up, but but that is a vulnerability that exists in one form of Node software that. The worst case scenario is that you run a node that you aren't certain is true, and and you could say that's that's pretty bad. That's well, it's certainly very bad if Coinbase is running a node that you know has Gets fraudulent close. data in there. But I think there is something to be said for the most common use case for a node is for me to run a node, mm-hmm. so that you know I'm going through it. I think that if you know, a company, a multi-million dollar company wants to run a node, they can do the due diligence to adjust the the way in which a node bootstraps mm-hmm. or, you know, only like manually trust certain nodes that they have verified through through some other auditing process. I think that the the relative costs of losing some amount of security for, for uh, like kind of a low risk common case is sometimes worth it. I mean, Ethereum right now is running more nodes than Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. And I think a part of that is because it's incredibly fast to, to bootstrap with um, with FastSync mm-hmm. uh, and, and not very data intensive. And I know Geth 1.81 really just crushed the numbers on that. And I, I think the attack factors are, are larger for that. But I think, you know, me just running a node to do a little bit of development, just play around with Ethereum, I'm, I'm not quite as concerned about that use case as somebody else and if somebody else cares a lot they can do a full sync instead of a fast sync or you know mm-hmm. they can they can choose which nodes they bootstrap from and and audit that themselves so let's take a step back here and uh de-alienate between a full sync and a fast sync for for our listeners okay so a fast sync um i'm i'm sure you all can imagine that after running uh uh, these these nodes and having this ledger go on for many years now, um, it's gotten quite large. That was the main divide between um, Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash was they wanted to make each block larger, and the Bitcoin Core team said, "No way, it's not going to scale. Um, it's already getting pretty big, um, and that's only going to make it worse." So so it is a problem, the idea of having to sync all of this data, and so to mitigate that. Um, one of the options, and I believe it's the default option now, but um, for uh, for synchronizing your your node with with the entire ledger is to verify a subset of the data on a lot of the older past transactions, and then only do full verification of the last ten twenty four blocks. So you you open up yourself to potentially being fed some some bad data about very old blocks but that would require um whoever to also have been able to generate 1000 blocks that are also fully valid which would require an absurd amount of computation power so so the agreement there or kind of the trade off there is someone doesn't have to forge the entire blockchain they only have to forge the last 1000 ones but then my sync is sped up by like you know a factor of a hundred or ten or whatever I, much it is. I think you might be able to manipulate data before the thousand blocks, right? I th- like if, I think basically you're doing a headers only sync until you get to some window, and so presumably if you can come up with a Merkle root 
that collides but contains you know the wrong data or or some some otherwise kind of bungled um, chain of headers that still passes geth's sync um, even even though it's doing um, a full sync of the last n blocks you still might have some some bad data embedded in there somewhere yeah that that could be possible from what I understand now I'm starting to step outside of my area of expertise a little bit again and work on the ecosystem not the core protocol but my understanding is that it wouldn't just be it, it couldn't be just one node who feeds you that that bad past data I believe there is corroboration in the network so it would require a lot of nodes to feed you that particular bad data or or just all the nodes that you're connected to and then you've got the right other. Yeah, so that's that's where something eclipse attack. like where Eclipse plus yeah. fast sync could lead to a difficult thing. So, but right, again, right. Coinbase, they're not going to do fast sync. They're going to do a full sync because they know the importance of this. Well, let's like, talk about Coinbase. They fucked up something this week where oh yeah. <laughs> they it was Coinbase's fault, wasn't it? Like I actually wrote about it on Monday or Tuesday. I forget when it was. But the way it was written in the article, the couple of articles that spoke about it, they said Coinbase fucked up in configuring their smart contract and was basically allowing their customers to steal Ethereum from them. Like, yeah, so what would happen is you would um, execute a transaction against their smart contract. And I don't know the particulars, but I know that there was some way to cause that transaction to become invalid after Coinbase had accepted it as valid. So even though your transaction did not go through on the blockchain, Coinbase's database would update with, oh, now you have however much Ethereum you just deposited. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, to your point, that that was, you know, an issue kind of with the contract that they wrote. Another example of Coinbase incompetence, but we're not going to dwell on that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Assume good faith. I, I, yeah, hopefully they're trying, you know. I believe they are. I believe they are. I just think they're a little misguided. Um, but oh, they're getting on the bus. They implemented SegWit. So. Yeah. yeah. I mean, after after trying to change the protocol <laughs> and, and getting screamed at after their poor Bcash launch. But let's not dwell on that. Let's not dwell on Coinbase. Brian Armstrong. He's getting he's getting he's getting like castrated in public right now. Yeah, and you know, as you said, <laughs> as you said in an early episode, um, we owe Coinbase a lot. We do. It's we do. You know, they we would they not owe. be where we are without them. Oh right. yeah, they were my baby's first exchange. Yeah, so. me too. Absolutely. So I mean, yeah, you never forget your first. You, you know, companies companies go through arcs, and uh, you always got to leave the door open. Right? But yeah. this particular bug, it really does make me wonder. So the the bounty that got paid out, ten thousand dollars, not bad. Ten thousand clambos. Should have been more. For, well, <laughs> how much they could have gotten? Like, oh yeah. Well, how but, much people could have taken them to the bank? Like. I would have given that. That's a that's hundred grand bug, at least in my mind. So the thing I'm wondering is if anybody had found this bug and said, eh, ten thousand bucks, or I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do this. You know, do we know that anybody hadn't exploited it? Hmm. I don't know. Well, would their database be able to catch it? Like, so I don't think. I think maybe if they went back and corroborated their database against the blockchain, because yeah. the contracts there, you can look at every transaction that went in on it. But I wonder if anyone's out there in the wind with. Would not be surprised. Yeah. Would not be surprised in the least. But. And the other thing is, like, what other inconsistencies might there be between the blockchain and, and any proprietary database, right? I mean, that's that's why, <laughs> this, guys, this is why we should stress, hold your own private keys, please. Like, do not trust exchanges. Like, the only time I've ever gotten burnt in this space is by exchanges. Like, it's happened. Like, in 2013, two, or excuse me, 2014, 2015, happened to me on two exchanges. Like, I might, like... Your shit jacked, like it, and like the one MinPal was a fucking exit scam. Hmm. Like you, you live and you learn. Yeah, scar tissue, man. Yeah, very, yeah, very aggressive scar tissue. Like you, you literally go to log in. And it's like, hey, this website doesn't work anymore, and your money's gone. <laughs> <laughs> I think my favorite was the ICO that uh, after I think they only made like. A thousand, two thousand bucks, but the guy just replaced the HTML file with the word penis. <laughs> that was his. That, that was his exit strategy. <laughs> Hopping on a plane to the Cayman Islands and just commits this one last change of penis dot HTML. I love it. Should, should, should we? Sorry, go ahead. Should we embark on a, on a penis game? Right? 
<laughs> That's how you got to end your episodes. Whenever you're done with this thing, just penis. penis. You're out. Um, I am not affiliated with these two. <laughs> <laughs> no relation. To your point about owning keys, though, I I feel like this this so this is something you work on. Yeah. So so this is kind of where I come in. So yeah, I mean, I I am also I'm super into controlling your own keys. I know that scares a lot of people. Um, so I just got to throw out there, if, if you own, I'm going to say more than, if you have more than like $1,500 into crypto, you owe it to yourself, buy a hardware wallet, probably even less. You know, I think if you, if you look at the management fee for any like investment, just apply that to your own investment. And whenever it exceeds the amount of a hardware wallet, that's, that's your management field fee. These things are great. I think, um, you know, I've heard some people say they're not sure about them or, or you know, whether or not. Um, but I, I have a lot of faith in them. If you're worried about holding your own keys, no reason you shouldn't go out and get one. I think Will might be alluding to a previous mystery guest. Oh, I might be. I might be. I might be throwing some shade myself. Who, Pierre? He wasn't a mystery. That's true. He wasn't a mystery. Pierre yeah. does not. Uh, he, was, he was. Yeah, he's. Is he still bearish on hardware wallets? He f- he was at the bit devs meet meet up last night. Sorry for doxing you, Pierre. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, he said he bought he had he's going to start experimenting with one. Not going to say boy. which which build, but it was ironic because last night we were going over uh, the ledger vulnerability that came out last week. That kid, let's talk about this. That like that kid Rashid. What's his? Uh, I don't know his last name, but he's 15 years old, and he's like literally finding all the bugs and the hardware wallets. He found one in Treasure a couple of weeks ago. He found one in Ledger last week. And the one in Ledger was pretty pretty egregious. Like you could remotely like attack a ledger, like from what he found. Well that's what does I mean, you know, this this may be a nonsensical argument, but it is one of these gut reactions I have, like to you know, to Pierre's point a little bit, I guess. It it does worry me a bit that there's this specialized device out there that's marketed with the intent of storing a lot of value and so it's like in some ways, that's that's kind of a honeypot, right? It's like it's a it, it's one thing that someone has to go out and think really hard about in order to attack uh, a lot of value. Though, I mean, any attack would require some amount of interaction with the device itself. Yeah, that's I mean, but that's the part that sketches me out. Like, you don't know what happens before that thing got to your doorstep. Like, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah I, I I totally agree. Um, well, at least in the case of any wallet. I've I've gotten there's usually a you know tamper proof sticker whatever I know on 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 the most recent Trezor model Model T um, great wallet by the way uh, not getting paid for that <laughs> um, they they put a sticker on the device itself and that thing will not come off oh, I really? I've been trying to scrub it off it's just like it, it looks awful so I hate that but I love knowing that if someone were to try to take that off I mean it's like embedded in the plastic or something oh, I don't wow. know. It's pretty hardcore, so I feel pretty confident, at least, that nobody got their hands on that, or they got their hands on those stickers. And this is another piece of advice for you freaks. Please do not buy your hardware while it's on eBay. Please. Oh, Oh, yeah. Definitely not. Don't buy them on eBay. I wouldn't even recommend Amazon. Would you recommend Amazon? Uh, I no, I've I've bought treasures from Amazon. They they do a pretty good job of sealing the tre. I'm. Is is Amazon just a distributor for like treasure or like? Do they buy a bunch of treasures and then distribute them from Amazon I, factories? I think these were cached in Amazon at some point. So okay. I, yeah, I'm I'm a I'm a mediocre cypherpunk at best. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like that's what we were talking about with all business, Pete. Before before we started recording, it's like is how can we how can we trust these things like? He he was more worried about like the fact that you can it's turtles all the way down. You can just copy the code and create like all these coins. But like, there's so many attack vectors at this point in time where it's like, we are taking a big risk. Like this is we are on the edge of computer science. I would say, I would say psychology too, because this is completely going to change, like the psyche of of humans. I would say, like if if sound digital money becomes a thing. Um, Not only that, but uh, like a deflationary economy. I mean, I guess maybe if you go go way, way, way back to, um, you know, when people, you know, Nick Zabo will tell you about when people were using shells, long shells as currency. And I suppose that's deflation. Well, not even really in the same sense that Bitcoin is because 
we kn we know that that Bitcoin has a limited supply. It's 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 a, a very clear um, feature of the system. So I yeah I mean I'm I'm kind of with you. I don't think um, humanity's ever gotten to play with a deflationary economy before or depla de deflationary store of value before. Yeah, when we were talking about that at at, at brec or brunch a couple weeks ago uh, for John's birthday. Sorry for doxing you, John. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's a lovely slaughter birthday. out here. <laughs> lovely birthday, and John's a lovely person. No, but we got into a really good conversation. Like, are we ready for like a, a change this big, of, like an economic paradigm? Like, it's fucking heavy shit to think about. Like, if if this stuff comes to fruition, like we're going to have to rethink the way like we consume. Yeah, I, I I agree. It's a little scary. I think um, back, you know, at the turn of the year when the price was going nuts and you know it was like oh wow okay bitcoin can achieve this sort of public acknowledgement um i was kind of thinking through scenarios where it it uh, it is say adopted internationally as some kind of de facto um store of value and say oil contracts are denominated in bitcoin and not the us dollar and then the us dollar crashes and um i mean that's that's like um that's a uh, the potentially it's 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 an interesting event with very scary implications in the short term well <laughs> thank you for the cue um i mean i i uh i think that we are not ready for it i think that maybe our kids will be ready for it mm -hmm. or their kids what about us makes us not ready for it i th i think um it's kind of like object permanence like it's something you either have or you don't have kind of as a as a being um and i think it it's probably a very hard thing to learn object permanence i've never heard that phrase oh that's the idea that um you, you know how kids like when you play peekaboo and you put your hand head behind your hands like they think you just vanish from the face of the earth they're like holy shit that's the most amazing thing i've just ever seen <laughs> bam you're back mm -hmm. um you know and i kind of think that that um it's that fundamental and it's that much of a thing that you need to learn um, when you're young. It's something you need to be comfortable with, the idea that something isn't there but it's there. Yeah. No, I agree. Like, we were thrown into this world of conspicuous consumption and we're addicted to it to a certain extent. Like, But, I mean, Will, to, to rebut that a little bit, how is looking at the balance on your wallet any different than looking at the balance on your checking account? I would say it's because there's a lot of infrastructure around it. So, well, for I, I, and certainly marketing. I mean, there's the idea that that if I walk in any bank, for whatever reason, I feel secure that I can get that money. I I know that that's not true. I've seen bank runs. I was in Colombia last year, and the line went out the block. Um, really? In the new year, yeah. What happened? I I don't know the particulars, but what I know is that you know I I was sitting out in a cafe and I watched the same person get in the line and like two hours later they finally were able to make it out with their money you think it was Venezuelans going over the border honestly no clue I, I'm uh, uh, painfully ignorant but what I do know is that for whatever reason you know my friends my family they trust that that exists they don't trust cryptocurrency which is ironic because I know I own my cryptocurrency I know that <laughs> I can take it that's the one thing that I do actually know is true. So I think it will take time for that trust to shift. Um, because right now people always ask me like, yeah, but what's it worth? What's it worth? Like what, you know, can you hold a Bitcoin? Yeah. What's the intrinsic value is all business Pete was just growing. Us up. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the censorship resistance. I mean, that's like, the, the, it's a power that we've never had before. I totally agree. I, I think when it comes down to it, that's the real distinguishing characteristic of, of Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies generally. I mean, the programmable aspect of this programmable money idea is a little bit overstated. I mean, we, we have programmable money right now. It's just that a lot of it resides in a, uh, in a private database. Um, but what we didn't have before is this way of transacting value that is not, that, that can't be stopped, where you can't you know, any one actor can't stop you from sending a payment to somebody. Um, that's the thing that we have to guard and preserve above all else, and that has to kind of guide our, our decision making around this stuff. Um, and so that's that's like my what I think about is like how can we keep the system as small? How can we keep the chain as small as possible while still facilitating that aspect of it, but without exposing us to other risks? Completely agree. I mean. 
it would be a non-starter for me like if it wasn't censorship resistance like that's the beauty of it like the fact that again we're going to get back to the sketchy area of embedding data into the <laughs> but <laughs> we always knew we were coming. are we gonna embed beefy bitcoin boys into the into if we the want game. to we can um, they're, they're gonna make them illegal <laughs> you better go now no but i was talking about like the one thing that fascinated me last year was somebody embedded information about the tiananmen square massacre into the blockchain like the fact that like if people were running nodes in china and were not even running nodes they had access to a block explorer and could decode decrypt that encoded text about Tiananmen Square, they could get access to something that is very, very, very illegal in China. Um, and something they should probably know about. So I'm, I'm sorry, just to get some clarification here, because I too, Marty, am, am an idiot. Um, and maybe James could answer this, but when people talk about encoding um, text about Tiananmen Square sounds, you know, not that not that large, but but when people are talking about you know trying to embed imagery and stuff like that into the blockchain, they're not just talking about committing a hash to it, right? They're talking about the actual content. What 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 is the vehicle? Yeah, I was I was reading a white paper about that. It has to do with a pay to fake key hash. Is that correct? Or... I don't know about fake key hash, but basically there is an instruction called push data, um, where you push an arbitrary piece of data onto the script execution stack. And so people, um, I, I guess, use or misuse that in various ways to just get some arbitrary data into the blockchain. So I think you need um, you need a, a parser that knows uh, a certain way to unpack whatever data that you've packed into the blockchain. Um, there's no like you know your your Bitcoin Core wallet isn't going to render the JPEG that you've just. Um, thrown in the chain, but some some program that's maybe doing both the serializing and the deserializing um, will know how to do that. Uh, not a recommended use of Bitcoin blockchain, by the way. Very expensive, but that actually does. I mean, that does make me wonder: um, is is there a use case for getting around this by not using um, typical standards like JPEG or PNG or whatever? I mean, could could you find uh, whole ways of communicating? these things in, in, in proprietary formats that are for, you know, some sort of like Chinese underground anti-censorship network. Um, and likewise, could I write a client that could kind of um, try to read the tea leaves of random data out there and generate bad stuff and say, oh, someone is trying to encode something in, in the blockchain, but actually it's just my particular client um, is, is, you know, trying to make a mess of the noise. Yeah, I, I just think with this stuff, we already have existing means that work well enough for transmitting um, verboten data. You know, we have Tor, um, we have torrents, uh, we have VPNs. And so the people of China can get at a lot of information. That's The, the blockchain doesn't really uniquely enable that. Um, didn't know that. Oh, yeah, yeah. I definitely. didn't know, like, I thought, I thought, like, VPNs and torrents in China would be, like, would not make it past the firewall. No, no. It's if if you go over to China, somebody can get you set up with a VPN pretty quickly. Really? Yeah. Again, I'm stupid. <laughs> He's not stupid. Um, but in you know, and and again, like hosting and retrieving um, any kind of data, uh, like a picture or or a piece of text, is fairly like. It's 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 not of the same criticality as like value transmission is. Yeah. And that's like so let's let's get on this. Like so where I feel like people are so misguided in this space is that like they're like, Wow, this new technology is gonna enable us to like rework like everything that we know now and we're gonna be able to make it turn it into a blockchain where like like I said on the last episode of this podcast, when you compare Bitcoin to things, stop comparing it to technology. You have to compare it to like macro things like salt. Like like salt was the base currency of spices for for a while and still is arguably like it, that is such a, a a fulcrum of like humanity that 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 we sort of revolve around that when we're comparing these blockchains to like facebook and myspace i'm just like you're completely missing the fucking point uh, in my mind like this is something like paradigm so paradigm shifting it's not social it's not like a social network it's orders of magnitude more it has orders of magnitude more gravitas than the sort of social media internet technology boom that we've experienced yeah yeah another um, kind of false analogy that i hear a lot 
is a uh, 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 VHS versus Betamax, right? And Betamax was the superior technology, but it lost out um, uh, to VHS in favor of, or because of, you know, distribution mechanisms or deals or whatever. <clears throat> and I think that's a really faulty analogy because, uh, again, the marginal difference between those two is is pretty slim. Um, and cryptocurrency systems are something that that are are totally predicated on the technical details and the design of these systems so i i think it's it's a really hard it's hard to draw analogy for this stuff because the the parameters of what makes a system resilient or valuable um are, are different than I, I think anything we've seen before um, I mean, I, I definitely agree that the the blockchain everything movement is probably one of the most like undermining things right now. Um, let me just throw out a quick uh, uh, Tales from the Crypt investment advice. We're going to start a new segment here. We're, on the we're not financial advisors, but <laughs> we will give some investment advice. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you see a hot ICO out there, and, and you're skimming that white paper, as we all pretend to do, but none of us do. There's only one section you need to read, which is, why is this a token? Or why is this on the blockchain? And if you see a lot of words that basically say, so we can get the money, or because we think it needs to be de decentralized, or whatever, if they can't explain to you why it should be tokenized, um, it's a terrible idea. The, the question I always like to ask people when they say, oh, is, is this a good use for the blockchain? Is, could you do that with Venmo? Would, it be, it, would everything be exactly the same if I could just transfer the value using Venmo? And if you're okay using Venmo, you, you should not be on the blockchain because you're already okay mitigating trust to some other party. The only things that should be on the blockchain are things in which you are completely unwilling to trust any entity. And that is a very small subset of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the the other shoe I'm waiting for to drop is th there's a lot of there's kind of a a lot of companies right now looking at trying to put physical assets on the blockchain so property cars you know whatever I'm waiting for the first judge to rule once somebody loses their wallet and loses their Ferrari coin for the judge to say no that guy doesn't own your Ferrari like you do you know because you're trusting property law at that point yeah that's the uh there's a lot of confusion uh around the intersection of meat space and digital space like there's like this is the whole oracle problem like what, what the fuck like there is what you have built into these protocols the rules that you have built in these protocols it goes back to the mike tyson philosophy everybody has a plan to get punched in the face <laughs> you fucking like you show up in the real world it's like come on you're really gonna seize my house because i lost my private key like something like that like we've got right it's not gonna happen no. i mean it, at least it's not gonna happen today yeah maybe way in the future i mean i don't know i'm sure back in settler times if you had the deed to this plot of land maybe the government would like kick the other guy out even if you stole it but uh, that's just not really the world we live in today right now and i it's I don't know. It's really going to take the wind out of somebody's sails when, you know, some judge rules against their entire platform. Yeah. And so let's go back to heuristics and let's go back to raising money. Like you were saying, like how much money ICOs have raised. It's been egregious. Like Tezos, what, $230 million, uh, a couple other projects in the three. Tron's million. still hanging in at number five? Yeah. So, I don't e know. EOS is definitely a money laundering scheme. They have an... <laughs> They have uh, an untapped ICO that's still going on, and they're still making millions of dollars a day, which leads me to believe that somebody's laundering money through that ICO. But I digress. <laughs> so let's talk about heuristics here. Like, so Tezos, Banker, uh, EOS raised hundreds of millions of dollars, zero product, Lightning Network, Lightning Labs, which Elizabeth Stark is the CEO of. Shout out, Elizabeth. Um, Shout out, Lalu. Shout, Shout out, out Yola. Shout out, Roast Beef. <laughs> Um, they just got, they just went to get a funding round and they only raised $2.5 million and they did it the traditional way and they did it with a product. Like, so to me, they, like, they have something built. It's on mainnet. It's working. It's not vaporware. It was like the whole Bcash, uh, FUD around Lightning Network that was going to be vaporware. Now it's on mainnet. It is something that is going to bring immense value to the Bitcoin protocol and network overall, not the protocol level. It's going to bring 
to the Bitcoin network and the mm-hmm. ecosystem. Um, and they only raised $2.5 million. So like you look at that, you say this is something with, that already has utility that has been proven. They didn't go the ICO route. And then it's like, why, why are people dependent? Like, do you think as somebody's working on Ethereum with Ethereum that like a lot of the ICO hype is, is doing you guys harm in any way? You know, actually, I think it's by and large dying out. Mm -hmm. Um, I think of the ICOs that I have somewhat paid attention to or know people who are working on them, um, all of them are, they're extending their windows. They're taking longer to reach their cap. If they even reach their cap, most of them aren't. Um, and they're, they're delaying it or, or, you know, otherwise, um, I, I think the ladder has been pulled up on that. I think everybody got caught up in the craze for a little while and it was a craze, but it was a craze. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think the network has chilled out. It's, you no longer get dosed where you just can't send a transaction for four hours unless you're willing to spend like three bucks. Yeah. Um, you know, th- that, that time seems to have gone by. Um, I, you know, I think a lot of people are still holding the bag on a couple of those, uh, it comes in waves though. It comes in waves. There's <laughs> going to be another wave at some point. It's like, that's another thing. Like how long is this, uh, this consolidation slash correction going to last? Do you think, is it, we're going to completely shift phases here, though. Like, So comparing this bear market, which is three months at most right now, um, to like 2014, 2015, do you think, obviously, the ecosystem is more mature. Do you think we have a similar like 18-month drawdown? Or do you think the hype got too high last year? Or do you think like the... i got to stop saying like... <laughs> <laughs> Man, it's the curse of the 20-something. It right? Just, you're, you're stuck with it. It's your right? accent. I think it's relatable, Marty. It it is. It is. Um, But is this time, is it different this time? This is a terrible question to ask because it will probably be proven wrong in a long time. But is this time different? You know, I'll take a whack at it. Um, People people tend to shy away from this kind of stuff. I I guess the caveats, I have no clue. Um, I, I think, though, that this stuff is kind of in the public eye more than it was. Like, there's this been this kind of critical mass of of oh okay you know you ask your man on the street what bitcoin is and instead of him saying get away from me what the hell are you talking about he's like oh yeah but have you heard about nano blocks you know um <laughs> so uh, I, but but at the same time i think the markets are extraordinarily irrational right now i mean when you have tron at a multi-million dollar market cap um, that means that prices might mean nothing. So I, I don't really know how to how to interpret that stuff. Um, I'm I'm fine waiting it out for a while. Uh, I'm you know I'm, I I would love to kind of get out. I've been trying to for the past week uh, to get out of the news cycles and just kind of put my head down and think about development. Um, think about how we can make this the system last um, and uh, preserve those characteristics of censorship resistance even through you know bear and bull markets um, but i i don't know i i think that this this concept um has been kind of sowed widely at this point across a lot of smart people and people are going to keep thinking about it and there's going to um keep uh, a, a pretty steady pace of of infrastructure development around it so um, i'd be surprised if if it was like a low period for a really long time but but like uh, you know as as people are quick to point out these low periods are nice because they kind of prune out the fair weather fans. Yeah, exactly. These are like my favorite. I mean, my favorite. I mean, ah, fucking millennial repeating like the same phrase. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, um, um, no, I love this period as well because people focus on the, the nitty gritty details. There's not too much. Like, it's impossible not to get caught up in the price hype when it's running that high. When you go from a thousand dollars to twenty thousand. You know. Yeah, yeah. My my attention span went to nil. You know, it was <laughs> it was horrible. <laughs> it was like no human is meant to engage in this kind of like speculation. Uh, yeah, it's just mental whiplash yeah. constantly. Yeah, but um, so there's a, let's segue into this. There's things getting built out right now. There's a lot of very intense conversations going on. Like, what is the next battle? So last night. We basically came to the conclusion for Bitcoin specifically, the next battle is going to be fungibility in my mind. Like that's going to be the next big, like what was the SegWit battle in the future is going to be the fungibility battle. And 
some people argue fungibility doesn't matter because of plausible deniability uh, at the protocol level. Some people say it doesn't matter at the protocol level because you can get it on second layers like Lightning and get fungibility there. Um, I would argue, though, that ideally you would want fungibility at the protocol level. Um, so for those of you who don't know, fungibility, I talked about this before, Matt Corallo, fungibility with the U.S. dollar cents is you go to a bodega, uh, you give a dollar, they give that dollar as change to somebody else. They have no idea that that dollar came from you. Right now on the Bitcoin network specifically, uh, you can sort of track transactions on the blockchain and sort of know which UTXO came from where. Um, so when you're spending Bitcoin, you're really spending un unspent transaction outputs, which is the UTXO. Uh, James in particular, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think the operative word in what you just said is um, ideally, you know, fungibility is ideally a, a, a characteristic that you want at the core protocol level. And, um, you know, let's take Monero, for example. Um, Monero has implemented uh, an early iteration of confidential transactions. Um, and they have a problem where the privacy of the chain is contingent on maintaining this notion of an anonymity set. And the upshot of their implementation is that the UTXO set is just unbounded in growth and you can't really prune it because if you prune it, then you reduce your anonymity set and you compromise the privacy of your users. So um, that's, a, that's a case, I think, where you have to weigh fungibility against scalability and you have to make sure that, again, you're not, you're not compromising kind of the core function of the system. Um, which is this censorship resistant value transfer. But then I guess that's sort of a circular feedback loop where it's like, well, to be censorship resistant, you have to be, you have to be sufficiently fungible. Um, but this is, this is again, another argument for keeping the chain really small. So, um, uh, you know, I'd encourage all the freaks out there to go and listen to Andrew Polstra's talks on what he calls scriptless scripts. And um, the main idea of scriptless scripts is that you can have this smart contract-like behavior um, live as a property of um, the public key and signatures of your transactions due to um, something called linearity that uh, signature aggregation buys you. Um, so I, I think there are some really exciting avenues out there um, for, for maintaining fungibility in that sense, and that, that basically amounts to moving data off of the main chain. So, you know, a criticism that you might be able to throw at Ethereum is that um, if you have your smart contracts living on chain, it's very evident uh, what an address does or, you know, if you have value at some address where that, where, you know, like what function that, that um, has been um, acted upon by. Whereas if you have, um, a, a, you know, a scriptless script-esque system or a system um, uh, or a method like uh, graph root or tap root, it's you know, one address looks like any other address, regardless of the mechanisms behind it, um, or, you know, what, what quote unquote contract acted upon it. So, um, I, I do think that there are some really promising avenues out there, but I think we have to be really conscious about the scaling implications, um, uh, of those means. Like for example, you know, Benedict Bunce and, uh, Polstra and, and a few other guys have come up with these bulletproofs which are a significant reduction in um, validation time for confidential transactions. But it's, it's still, I think it's still widely considered to be too slow for Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, it's an outstanding question as to whether we're going to get to a point where the Bitcoin community considers confidential transactions to be uh, safe to implement. Um, so, yeah, we'll see if we get there. Um, I, I do think the second layer is, is pretty promising. Um, but admittedly i haven't thought a lot about this stuff so i haven't, I haven't really so really so with the with the second layer scripts um how how is the the trust mitigation handled where there is a layer outside of the, the protocol that i now have to trust that it's going to do the right thing to some capacity there are ways of mitigating that but what, what's kind of the angle with with like um i mean i've listened to the the scriptless script talk and i understand how there's some sort of exchange of of hashes that that sort of proves intent, um, it, namely as it relates to like atomic swaps, I think was the example given there, but but it didn't really speak to like one of one of the things that that you pointed out about Ethereum is that uh, an, an address is an address, you you know what's on it, you know if it's if it's a contract, you can grab that bytecode if you want. Um, 
But part of that allows people to not have to trust what they're sending to is going to work. They can actually, you know, validate that and verify that. Um, obviously, you're going to get, you're still going to get the people who are responding to send me 0.5 ether and get five ether back. I'm Vitalik. Here's free stuff. Um, <laughs> but you know, a- anybody who's concerned with their money could could directly go to, um, you know, a blockchain explorer, see that okay, this is a legitimate address, and here's the the code that it's running. Um, like what what exists for a, a second chain solution or uh, sorry a level two solution. So a lot of the difficulty in designing these layer two protocols is is thinking about the fraud case. Um, and if you hear a guy like Taj outline how Lightning works um, or how discrete log contracts work, you'll see that that they think about almost every case where somebody lies. Um, you know, somebody tried to slip the wrong signature in in um, you know various places um and uh, like lightning i I think it it basically you're you're you know lightning is a trustless protocol and that's because um if anything goes screwy you can you arbitrate with the main chain so at every step within the lightning protocol you're swapping a signed transaction right and you can take that signed transaction and then go broadcast it on the main chain and get out um so I, i i think that's the key and the same thing with um, with you know atomic swaps. Basically, the idea is that this action that you've opted into consciously happens atomically, or it doesn't. Um, and then the idea with um, scriptless scripts is that basically, um, you know, you're you're committing to a certain operation within the public key, and um, you know, in say sending someone a Bitcoin, you get revealed to you um, uh, the elements of something that'll it'll give you what you want provably so um i don't think anybody's proposing second layer protocols that that require um any kind of mitigation of trust or or trustlessness um i think it's more a matter of convenience like you know you might have to pull and watch for fraud or you might have to make sure that you're able to broadcast um your your get out of dodge transaction fast enough um i think it's more of a convenience aspect versus like a theoretical um uh, shift in trust model yeah and i i mean i guess um to to some extent i i sort of understood that um you know going into that question i guess what i want to maybe clear up is is um why is it that that trade-off is superior to various other trade-offs to make things scalable at a and still be trustless yeah that's a good question i i guess because um it's opt-in so um your base case is always bitcoin's trust model which is really strong and conservative um and you know if you want to you can decide to allocate some some percentage of value to to whatever trust model sounds good um but there's kind of limited risk there if if that trust model goes awry somehow. I think in in a startling event we agree, um, <laughs> because yeah, I, I agree that um, you should opt into as much security as you want. And I think you know one one of the common um, attacks against like sharding is um, oh well you've just you've just halved or whatever percentage cut your network security but you know there are ways of orchestrating between shards to to validate each other and i think that's like another opt-in situation let's dive into sharding because this is something that befuddles me like so the transition from pow to pos how do you see that playing out Uh, this is on ethereum in particular so for those of you who don't know ethereum has plans to transition from proof of work to proof of stake uh, to a Casper implementation. There's two competing Casper implementations right now, right? So, from my understanding, Casper will ship with both implementations. Okay. And there is some mechanism by which you Choose. you indicate which you're on. Honestly, that that is a little outside of my understanding. Um, just to clarify, though. Proof of stake and sharding are, are separate they are? features. Oh. I don't. I think you can 
get one without the other and like they're they're being developed in tandem rather than because sharding sh- you can do sharding on like typical databases right now correct or yeah yeah definitely um yeah the the, the, thought... the name sharding comes from the common technique most websites you know obviously facebook they have a billion users they can't keep that all on one computer so it's just mm-hmm. the idea of splitting work and data across multiple machines sometimes with redundancy mm-hmm. to ensure that um, either the data is correct or that if you lose a machine you don't lose all of its data but and what's interesting to put about point out about sharding is that it's it's only an effective technique because typically as a data designer you can choose what you're sharding on so you you choose some um, feature of the data that you think um, is going to mean that you're not you're not going to have um, kind of cross interactions between you know separate uh, shards um, or, or maybe you want some kind of uniform distribution of data access across shards. But the point is that you're designing with with some kind of heuristic in mind that is going to tell you whether the, the, the sharding scheme makes sense. Um, and I think doing that in a general case, to me, sounds kind of dubious. Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, one of the things that we as engineers have to kind of shift our our mentality about is is we don't know the use case for 100 years from now. You know, if you want to build software that's going to be around, um, you have to think pretty agnostically about this stuff. Um, and, and I will admit, you know, having read a lot about sharding, there there are a lot of, if not answered, but like a lot of, you know, unknowns about exactly what the most effective way for uh, shards to communicate with each other. But it, it is planned for. And, and you know, I think... Um, these things are are open ended. Still, I think um, there would be a level of hubris in anybody to say I have the solution that will work forever. And I think these protocols are they're they're ever shifting. As much as you know, I think uh, the Bitcoin core team would like to pretend that it's going to be soft forks from here on out. There will be occasions that rely on hard forks. Like what? <laughs> I don't know, like zk snarks or something. You can do that as a soft fork. Oh, really? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Now, see, this is where James rocks me. Um, so I'm not, I'm yeah. not gonna I'm not gonna duke this out, especially not while we're recording, because I'm just gonna make myself a fool. But um, yeah, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Marty's just gonna hit the edit button on that one for me. <laughs> Penis. <laughs> <laughs> no, somebody somebody out there on the internet can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but basically, because of uh, the way that SegWit works, it kind of virtualizes um, the scripting system. And so I, I think conceivably you can do ZK snarks without a hard fork. So what happens, because as I understand, hard forks are when you loosen constraints and soft forks are when you tighten constraints. Yes, that's correct. Mm-hmm. So what happens if I'm running a node and I hit one of these newer, you know, like an opcode or something like that, um, and I don't know what to do with it? So if you're running an old node, I mean, the way that SegWit worked is that the the transaction, if it's seen by a non-upgraded node, sorry, we were uh, motioning at another wine bottle, which is exactly the direction this conversation needs to go in. Um, if if an unupgraded node... 2015 Cali Cab. That's right, Lee's Fitch. Cali Cabs all day. If an unupgraded node encountered a, a SegWit transaction, it was considered anyone can spend, and so in that way, um, SegWit was it was a tightening of the rules, basically. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there there, there may be some factor uh, of zk snarks that I'm un- unaware of, but I don't think I mean it, it's I don't I don't know that it would. Um, well, maybe the setup aspect might require something, sp- but but generally speaking, I think validation of a transaction um, is now kind of virtual because of um, the way that SegWit works. So uh, there's a lot that we can do without um, a hard fork necessary. All right, you heard it here first. Um, Bitcoin is done with hard forks. No more hard forks ever. (laughs) James O'Byrne certified. You can follow him uh, at James O'B on Twitter and (laughs) yell at him the next time there's a hard fork. Well, let's get into this. Like... It doesn't even, I mean, I'm not going to say whether or not there's not or is going to be hard forks in the future, but it doesn't matter if you own Bitcoin right now, like you own the UTXO set, like if it does hard fork, 
talking about. Oh, I, I have no con- I think hard forks are a healthy thing to happen. Yeah, I'd, when I would agree. The majority of the people involved in keeping this so thing running agree that it's a good thing to have happen. Let's dive into it. Let's dive into why most people hate Ethereum and why I was an Ethereum believer before the Dow hard fork. Like, oh man, I knew it. I before knew it, it was like, coming. It, I knew it, was it had coming. to come. What did you expect? Oh you no, won- no, I, I don't, I don't shy. In the same way that James is not shy away from price talk, which by the way, I will never comment on price <laughs> in a recorded <laughs> format. You know, at your own risk, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but I, I have no I have no concern about that because it wasn't just the Ethereum Foundation going, yo, we screwed up or somebody screwed up, like it let's pretty fix much it. was though. It pretty much was. Like it, there's chat logs of Vitalik going to all the exchanges, like, all right, you guys can stop trading now. We're about to hard fork. And then the vote that they had where they reached consensus was like one percent of the coins in circulation and they I think it was maybe more than one percent, but it was like on that order. Yeah, but but and I mean, if if there if there were and there were, but because obviously we in have their Ethereum. defense, most people that owned Ethereum probably weren't technically competent enough to to participate in that vote. It was probably speculators who were not technically savvy. I mean, I also think that is probably true. If Bitcoin came up with a contentious thing, that most people would not be technically savvy. I mean, I mean, this is the, the truth of any vote, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, who. You know, who among us is well versed enough with like agriculture and you know whatever to 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 be able to vote on like certain I'm actually very tariffs well or agriculture. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Fanquake, uh, the Bitcoin Core. Um, this this guy is an unsung hero. Fanquake is a longtime core contributor, and um, uh, this guy I, I met him a few weeks ago, but he's super super interesting. He lives in Western Australia, and he is a farmer. And he runs an autonomous farming operation where all of their machinery is is autonomously operated. But this guy's a hero because for every pull request that comes into Bitcoin Core, he tags it with relevant labels and he does a lot of um, categorization work on the build system. And it's like it's almost instantaneous. Every time you open a pull request, he's somehow like awake and conscious and looking at your work, <laughs> despite the fact that he's running a friggin' farm in Australia. That's fucking cool shit. Um, going back to the Dow hack. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry to get us off talk. No, I love no. That. He almost saved me. We we almost stopped talking about it. For- no, but like going back to it, like it goes back to. This is what irks me about Ethereum, like the way they d- marketed it. Like again, like it's heavy marketing on the front end and then tech on the back end in my mind, and the whole unstoppable code is law meme that they sold Ethereum on, and as soon as the Dow hack happened and unfortunately solidity was a, a shitty programming language that that allowed for a leak in the contract on the dow and specific specifically like code is supposed to be law and like from an economic perspective like if you're going to market that like if you're you're going to like market your system as code is law what code is written is going to happen and then the first time some shit hits the fan you're like actually code's not law we're going to change the code so, well i so i i still believe in the code is law thing but law exists to serve the people that it governs this is where we get into like social right right right. yeah i mean there's a lot of semantics that we could get into but basically you know the laws that this you know that any country started with are not the laws that are there today laws exist to serve the people and if they no longer serve the public interest we amend laws all the time you know and i don't see why what potentially could be the platform you know of of many things of the future is to be immutable that that would be ridiculous you know if if i if i were going to build my product on top of something and i were to hear that there would be you know no room for change even if everybody else wanted it i wouldn't build on top of that you know things need to be dynamic especially in software well that's my whole point is push that shit to the second layer. Like the protocol layer should not like, like code should be law. Like you should you should for certain be able to tell into some point in the future that these things are for certain. Like there's gonna be twelve and a half Bitcoin created every ten minutes until block to six hundred thirty thousand. Like we're not gonna we're not gonna reverse a transaction on the blockchain because somebody got money stolen from them. Like it again 
I just lost my train of thought. I'm drunk. Well, let me. All right. So let me take us on a on a brief digression here yeah. into um, something a little cosmic. Oh yeah. A little cosmic. Let's get cosmic, know, John. We're getting waiting. cosmic in memory. <laughs> Rip, John. <laughs> um, this I think highlights why uh, culture is really important in these systems. Mm-hmm. And so you can say, okay, so the Dow hard fork happened. Um, from a technical standpoint, it was a hard fork. So if you don't agree with the Dow, you can just mosey on over to Ethereum Classic and continue on with your chain. Now, Sitting at a solid, I don't know, 30 bucks or something? Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly, yeah. right, right. So, so, so technically, that was um, your outlet if you disagreed with that change. But in actuality, you know, y- y- the system moved a certain way, even though technically it was it was capable that you could, um, you know, opt into the other system. Um, so I, I think that highlights, like, a lot of the more nuanced um, discussions that we have around uh, Bitcoin design are, are in culturally, what is this going to do? So a great example of this is a little-known feature of the Bitcoin system right now is something called checkpoints. Marty, you ever, you ever read up on this stuff? Uh, I have heard about checkpoints. I've not read deep enough into them to speak. Okay. With any authority. So, so basically, the gist behind checkpoints is there are hard coded hashes in the Bitcoin Core code base. And we say basically, at, at height X, we expect the block to have hash Y. And if it doesn't have that hash, then something has gone wrong and you're downloading from the wrong peer. <clears throat> so, this opens up a, a pretty interesting discussion because you think to yourself, Okay, well, that's that's pretty, you know, that seems reasonable. That seems practical. If we have a reorg, um, basically, if someone reveals a fork of the blockchain that is longer than the current blockchain that wipes out, say, you know, two years worth of history, well, then we should pack up our bags and go home because this little experiment is over. Um, so the idea of checkpoint sounds totally reasonable, but the contention is, that it introduces this cultural element of the developers basically codifying what the right chain is. And is is that a road that you want to go down? You know, people in Bitcoin are very averse to that. I think often the, the culture kind of dictates that, that uh, consensus is emergent and that the developers don't define which chain is the right chain other than the fact that the right chain is the longest valid, I'm sorry, the most work valid chain. Um, another kind of uh, issue on the technical horizon for us is thinking about some kind of fast sync equivalent. So one option for doing fast sync in Bitcoin land is that you can commit to the hash of the UTXO set within every block so that when you're doing your initial block download, um, instead of having to download and validate everything, you can just download headers and then say, okay, this header chain is valid. And I'm going to take the hash of the UTXO set for the last header that I downloaded and download that entire UTXO set, which is roughly three gigs right now, um, from my nearest peer. You know, and that would allow you to sync much more quickly than downloading the entire blockchain and validating it. But, but that's slightly changing the cultural and trust model. You know, you're, you're now talking about having miners include this hash that's relevant for, for IBD. So I, I think culture is really, really important. And I think... A lot of what weirds me out about Ethereum is that th- there are these very vague elements of their culture about the trust model and about things like long-term viability. That um, what's vague about it? I, I think the idea that like proof of stake uh, has demonstrable drawbacks um, and concerns and, that are kind of fundamental to the nature of proof of stake, and people still kind of go on with it not Um, to go too far into rabbit holes but would you mind elaborating for our audience no this is an important discussion to have because this is i mean ethereum the ethereum project's banking its future on proof of stake which is unproven up to this point right so the classic one is called the nothing at stake problem and that's this idea where you can attempt to submit fraudulent data to the chain um, and get penalized for it. But if you succeed, then you can basically roll back those dings um, that, that you were hit with uh, and thereby kind of removing the negative incentive to cheat. 
and to my knowledge, this is why um, Ethereum is is right now either entirely proof of work or a combination of proof of work, proof of stake. So in in this case of rolling back, I mean, so if you have some number of nodes who have already accepted that you got slashed. Slashing is when you say, hey, you tried to lie to us and we're going to take your Ethereum now, the Ethereum that you staked. The rolling back, how how is it that you roll back further than what, what block is on your plate now to validate? Now, does that require like a mass takeover of the network where you're feeding bad data from multiple blocks? I don't think so. I mean, maybe it's along the lines of a reorg where you just introduce another chain that's longer and still valid and then feed that to your peers. So to, to my understanding, proof of stake, it, it's sort of this round robin consensus thing where a handful of people are, are told, hey, divine us the next block. Um, those who have staked, you know, money on it. And then and then kind of among them, uh, the largest consensus, in, consensus is the next block. And anyone who diverged from that uh, if they were breaking rules, get slashed. So if you get a few blocks deep, I don't understand how you can propose something. I, I mean, I think that's that's a basically a fifty-one percent attack, right? You have to have enough people not slashing you in order to allow for this longer chain. Mm. Which, to me, you know, I I mean, it's like anything; it's levers that you pull. Um. One of the things that I think Bitcoin has relied on is, is is hash rate, and that's always you know kind of the, for lack of a better word, this thing that's advertised. It's got the highest hash rate. You know, we, we're so strong. Um, Bitcoin beefcake. Bitcoin, <laughs> Bitcoin is beef. beefcakes. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, where was I going? I've lost my hash rate. Yeah, it's I catching mean, up to me. This uh, is you're talking about reorgs and 51 percent tax. Right with reorgs. So, so there your risk is. 51% of hash rate, which, um, you know, it's 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 like an attack that people talk about sometimes. There's obviously the quantum, quantum computing thing. I think that if you were to have picked Satoshi's brain way back when, he would have never guessed that, like, ASICs would have been a huge thing and that China would have been, like, the, you know, one of the hugest miners and that three three of the largest miners control more than half of the network. Like, there there is a lot of friction to working in meat space. And so, you know, I think the intuition to move more of this into a frictionless environment, like, kind of sits well with me. Wait, what do you mean? What are we moving into a frictionless? And what well, is frictionless? Does frictionless exist? So I would call proof of stake frictionless because it deals with fewer real world um, possibilities. You know, one of my favorite things is the Bitcoin Dyson sphere, you know, <laughs> surrounding the sun with solar panels to power uh some like ultra powerful computers we have to get the thorium reactors first before we get the dyson spheres it's <laughs> marty's part-time project yeah while everyone is throwing economics books on your reading list i'm gonna throw out three body problem because that's my jams so i'm, I'm taking that? us into sci-fi literal cosmic uh, get into so. three body problems who's that by um that's uh shu uh shu lin or shu lu maybe yeah, yeah uh Shin Lu? Shin Lu? Man, I'm, I don't I'm, know. Yeah, I'm getting... It's three body problems. Look getting wrecked out here. Three body problem. It's a trilogy. Greatest sci-fi I've ever read. Chinese author. Talks a lot about... Um, uh, Ga the game theory of the universe. Yeah, and, game theory of the universe. Um, Holy shit. I've never heard it summed a, up so well. It's a deeply terrifying book to read. I feel like we're about to dive into that with the Glass Bead game, too. Oh, I'm just reading man. the introduction to that. Like, oh man, yeah, we haven't even told you guys about the glass bead. All right, yet. I'm I'm gonna let all you right. lay that no, down hard. Get, no, I want after. No, I want the three no. body, and I I agree, I agree. I want to I want to keep going with the three body problem because this is another one of those topics that we completely agree with across the. <laughs> Sorry, it's just the Dyson sphere made me think of it. There's there's a lot of crazy theoretical science going it, on in it, that book. It's a really yeah, it's a really interesting book because and it kind of mirrors cryptocurrency a little bit because. The author basically really investigates the incentives of, of life across the universe and makes it into an incredibly hostile and dark place um, and plays out those implications in, in um, uh, fairly vicious and inspiring ways. Um, so highly recommend the three-body Yeah, problem. surprisingly large amount of analogies to cryptocurrency space. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, what I was describing with a frictionless environment is one in which, you know, so, so like I was saying, Satoshi probably could not have imagined 
A6. Probably could not imagine a, a, a Dyson sphere, you know, around the sun. But when you put something into software, um, a lot of the unknowns become known because you sort of define the space. Now, there are unknowns in there. That's basically what a bug is, or at least a good bug. A bad bug is somebody made a mistake. A good bug is there is an unknown in the way something operates and someone exploits that. So proof of stake largely moves your staking out of meat space. So, you know, having a server farm that mines into virtual space and removes a lot of the unknowns. You know, what if what if someone in an attempt to do a 51% attack were to fire missiles at all of the, you know, physical mining devices? Like you just you can't account for that on a network whereas you know in 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 a proof of stake situation like most of those kinds of physical possibilities are accounted for all right so a few thoughts here um the first is that when you when you you know say like you were to move to proof of stake and shift your trust model in that way fun fact um meltdown inspector could be used to steal from hot wallets pretty trivially so you now so meltdown inspector for those that you don't those of you that don't know is the inherent uh backdoor in intel chips correct not even just intel i think um i think it may be more any chip general. going back to 1995 or something like that yeah, basically so so when you know programs have what we call branches and that's like you know one of n ways a program's execution can go and what what chips do to speed up execution is something called branch prediction. So um, sometimes they'll execute something kind of in the quote unquote future of a program, even if they're not sure that it's going to happen. Um, and they then cache the result so that they can serve it up to you if it actually does happen. And, and this has per certain performance benefits. So anyway, um, Meltdown Inspector can be used to read uh, arbitrary data out of memory um, uh, from a process that isn't yours. So if you're staking and you have your funds tied up in a hot wallet, Meltdown or Spectre could have resulted in a confiscation uh, of everything on the network, potentially. Um, when you have a SHA-256 miner, that's an incredibly dumb machine. Uh, SHA-256 is an incredibly simple thing. And, and I think that's what I love about it is that it, it, in a way the simpler the simpler and more straightforward your hash function not only are the incentives easier to reason about but um, the mining hardware itself can democratize and and I think as Marty points out a lot on Twitter which I love is that ultimately when mining hardware commoditizes and people kind of saturate the technical innovations that go into making a SHA-256 256 squared chip you're gonna get to this point where the capex on running a mining farm is is kind of like uh, dwarfed by the opex and all of a sudden you don't care if your mining hardware is only utilized half the day so all of a sudden now you've got a solar array in the desert that's mining bitcoin for you um, i don't know if it's exactly going to pan out that way but the point is that it's it's an incentive mechanism to encourage development of alternate energy that isn't just kind of burning burning oil which is something really cool and you're you're hitting all of my you know love of sci-fi potential future outcomes, but I think that the reality right now is that that is not what's happening. What's happening is that cheap electricity means hash rate, and that's why you have places like China that have an unbelievably large hold on hashing power. And while I want to believe that future, um, I feel like reality has a way of always twisting your expectation. And so, you know, I, I kind of like proof of stake as a rejection of reality. And it's saying we're going to build our own reality in which we can define the rules by which we we hold people accountable for their actions. Um, I don't pretend to know, you know, all of the ins and outs of the implementation um, and whether, you know, certain vulnerabilities are going to hit it. I think one thing that I believe will happen is we will see specialized staking hardware that will, you know, it's not going to be an operating system. It's not going to be... Uh, you know, also like playing video games and browsing the internet, it's going to be a piece of hardware that is is a little ROI machine. You throw a hundred ETH on that thing, and it gives you back five percent a year, something like that. Yeah, and that's so. That's my main beef with POS. So, like, full disclosure, like I said this in the last podcast, like 
just for shits and gigs. Like I staked a coin, a POS coin for two years. And it's just like, again, going back to heuristics, like it just, it doesn't, it's too easy to an extent in my mind. Like it's too easy. Like you're say, Marty, that's the weakest insult (laughs) I've ever heard. Oh, it's just too (laughs) convenient for me. No, I, no, it's like, it's just, again, like, again, going back to like heuristics like proof of work like i think you need to work like this is like going back to like existential like being a human like and how do you like attain what you uh assume is self-actualization which is takes hard work and determination and again going back to like proof of like this is i don't know if this is a good analogy or not but like proof of work like the fact that we're expending so much energy and putting so much value into a proof of work system gives it a lot of value whereas proof of stake you just flip up like your macbook and just let it run for two years and you make money doing nothing but hoarding like and and again proof of stake incentivizes hoarding in my mind which and like that's a big that's the big meme in bitcoin is hodl which i would argue is different than hoarding which proof of stake enables and encourages well so i mean you could call it hoarding or you could call it investing which is, you know, something our modern economy really values a lot is is investing, and that's investing in the security of the network, and but, you you get yields from that. Mm-hmm. You know, there is still liquidity in the market by way of fees, and those fees go to you. They don't go like directly back into stake, and you can do whatever you want with it. Likewise, when you talk about the ease of access, yeah, it's easy for you to flip open a MacBook and and start you know staking a shit coin, but we're talking about thousands of dollars here, which. There is still a barrier to entry, though I like that it is not a physical barrier. I don't have to go, you know, in New York, it's impossible to mine. Electricity is expensive. Space is expensive. And, like, my apartment gets hot enough in the summer, you know. So I'm not, I'm not going to go mining. <laughs> but I can, I can stake um, regardless of where I am if I have the investment in the network. You know, I, that's really the main benefit to me is it just feels like it levels the playing field on a lot of things. I hate the idea that I would be mining at a loss in America. I got a mid Washington state. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, and uh, so another interesting factor here is in proof of work, um, quickly your, your, your limiting characteristic becomes, um, heat diffusion. Uh, so, so, like, to, to get back to what Marty was kind of getting at, um, when you're doing proof of stake, all you need is a lot of Ethereum. Um, but to do a giant proof of work operation, you actually, like, there's not that economy of scale. There's an anti economy of scale because when heat diffusion is your limiting factor, you need a giant space. You need to go out and get a bunch of land. And so that ceases to become just having a lot of Bitcoin. And actually that anti-economy of scale becomes a forcing function for decentralization. So as soon as as soon as mining commoditizes, I'm going to go out and buy a how long miner or you know whatever it is that comes around and 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 run my little miner because that will be reasonably profitable. Yeah, but you're also the guy who quits his job to go work on Bitcoin <laughs> core like you're pretty hardcore, you know, I uh, it doesn't matter what the investment opportunity is for somebody, even if there are gains on it, people are, you know, um, they're into the value that they can see. And if you tell somebody plug in this computer um, and it'll make you money, I don't think that's going to reach mass adoption. I mean, there was a there was a Wi-Fi startup or, or a, an ISP startup a, a while ago. I can't remember the name, but their idea was plug in your router and set it to be open. And by setting it to be open, we'll subsidize it because what they were doing was charging people to access these open routers, and the idea was... You mean, like, open some ports or something else? No, 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 like, like you know, no web key oh, thing. Oh, okay. You know, Fly basically everybody was a Boingo hotspot. Yeah. Right? And and that was their idea. And nobody did it, of course, because there was just this inherent, like, oh, I don't want to open my my network up, you know, which, don't get me wrong, it's a good attitude to have. Um, Shout-outs to uh, Web2. It's good stuff. Shout-out Web2. Um... I guess we'll shout out. Later. <laughs> <laughs> Marty's not in on that one. Usually, I feel like I can I can rally a shout out to pretty much anything, but that let's, was a poll. Let's um, go web to. Uh, is that Barstool Louie that that originated from? Is that is that a Louie meme? I don't know. I'm I'm gonna give it to Louie. All right. Shout outs to Louie. 
Shout um, out Deep Web Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Deep Web Tim. He's probably loving this conversation. Deep Web, when are you coming on the pod? We've been asking for a while. Yeah, man. Uh, but anyway, um, I, I don't know. I, I think I hear a lot of these like lofty answers to to really a lot of the questions that I have about not just proof of work, but a lot of like Bitcoin things. And there is always an answer. And I, I would almost call it a canonical answer because I hear it from more people more than once. But they don't always feel like realistic answers to me. They feel like like coming up with an idea in a frictionless environment, but interacting with a very frictionful environment, which involves, you know, real people. Well, that that's literally my argument against proof of stake. I think human systems are more complicated than thermodynamic systems. And proof of stake is inherently a more social thing than having an ASIC chip that proves that you've done something. But we can agree it goes beyond thermodynamics. It goes on, you know, if if the president decides to put tariffs and taxes on 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 foreign imports, well, now all of my hardware gets more expensive, and now the decentralization fails because it's cheaper to run this hardware everywhere else in the world. That's fleeting to an extent because it's only for. I would argue that's like that. That could be temporary. Well, Whereas, network security is not a temporary issue. If you have, true. if you open yourself up to a single fifty-one percent attack, as James puts it, you might as well go home. And I'm going to cut it there for right now. I don't want to bore you guys with uh, too much information at once. We'll be back tomorrow with the rest of this conversation. <laughs>